when we put the agenda together, we, we started with a lot of sort of technical, security-oriented presentations and panels, and then built up into um, more sociological, political, policy-oriented uh, ideas and presentations. Our next speaker, Max Alexander, one of my best friends, um, is in the theater business. And uh, prior to that, he was one of the top people at Talk Talk, which is one of England's biggest ISPs. Uh, he's a strategist, he's an advisor to governments. Uh, he most recently ran uh, the Really Useful Group, which is Andrew Lloyd Webber's production company, and he's here to talk to us about social inequality or equality. We'll, we'll find out shortly. Max Alexander. I got an audio cue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, lacking both domain expertise and a compelling superhero style backstory, whenever I'm invited to talk, I fall back on what I have boundless reservoirs of, which is prejudice and incohate rage. Um, and so today, and these sessions often are, public therapy sessions for me to work out my anger issues, and that makes you a sort of collective analyst for which, for which I thank you. What a pickle we find ourselves in, ladies and gentlemen. What poison flows through the veins of the body's politic of the West. The governments characterized as they are by combination of cynicism, greed, venality, fear, incompetence, and prioritization meltdown seem uniquely ill-equipped to deal with the nested series of crises that assail us. And it wasn't supposed to be like this. I was fortunate to grow up in the 90s, the long, cozy, complacent decade where at least for America and most of Europe, the world was getting apparently better. Budget surpluses, the end of the Cold War, treatments for HIV, the internet, ecstasy, even climate change seemed to be a manageable problem with the Tokyo process. How did that all turn to ashes? And we are here as on a darkling plane, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. As you can hear, I am a posh Brit, and every fiber of my being, every neuron in my brain is screaming at me to lighten up with some casual off-the-cuff irony or self-deprecating insouciance. But what I'm going to talk about today is important. It's indeed the most important thing. And so I'm going to read it out slowly and carefully and without rhetorical flourish. And it all starts with a relationship uncovered by a French economist named Thomas Piketty, amused upon at great length in his book, Capital in the 21st Century. And I have read it, so you don't have to. And this relationship has been refined since then, but it's generally agreed to hold over most periods of five or more years. And it can be expressed as, where R is greater than G, inequality tends to grow. R is the return on capital in the form of dividends or interest or asset price appreciation. G is the total growth in the economy. And so when R is greater than G, the people who hold capital and the people who receive those incomes tend to do better than the people who rely on their labor for their income. And this inequality is measured uh, or expressed as what's called the Gini coefficient. Now, my wife uh, told me that I ought to explain this to you, um, and I thought that I haven't, but even though she's not in the room, I shall, as I know my place. The Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality in society, inequality either of wealth or of income, and it runs between zero and one. One is a society where everything is owned by the god king, and zero is pre-lapsarian communism, where everything is shared or more accurately held in common. And it can be calculated pre and post taxes and transfers. And post seems to be the most sensible way of thinking about it. And it's been so calculated for most of the countries in the world. 
and they range from between, between 20 and 60, with the northwestern European countries clustering around 20, Australia, New Zealand and Korea in the low 30s, UK and the USA in the high 30s, Mexico, Russia and Turkey sneaking into the 40s, and then the remaining countries in Latin America and Africa in the 60s are uh, culminating, depending on your point of view, at the top or the bottom with lucky old Lesotho, which measures in the 64. And it's my contention that most of the ills of the world for most of history can be laid at the feet of this simple axiom, which is best summarized as the man has been taking your stuff and everybody else's stuff pretty much since the first medium-sized cities took root in the mudflats of the Euphrates about 5,000 BC. And if R is chronically, axiomatically greater than G in the long term, then the future is bleak indeed, and satire will butter no parsnips, and you should all be arming yourself and storing beans and water in your cellar. Historically, R is less than G most profoundly when war, revolutions, or natural disasters smash or expropriate property on a large scale, which is not in itself helpful for our persisting liberal democracy. And if that's the only way out, then again, guns, ammo, and beans seem an appropriate reaction. But the good news is that for about 60 years, from the 30s to the 90s, and particularly from the end of the Second World War to the early 80s, R was not generally greater than G, and inequality shrank while still allowing the rich to be rich. This was a function of relatively high rates of taxation on the well-off, a robust policy of welfare-driven re redistribution, and in Europe, universal health care and tertiary education free for all. But since about the time of Reagan here and Thatcher in the UK, the trend has flattened and then got into sharp reverse. America, since 1980, has seen all of the proceeds of economic growth being appropriated by the top decile, and 60% of that by the top 1%, and about two-thirds of that 60% by the, toint, the top 0.1%, a curiosity known as the fractalization of wealth. No matter what resolution, the small fraction at the top of the scale seems to do wildly and disproportionately better than everyone else. Have nots, have lots, have yachts. In fact, by just about any measure, asset poverty, indebtedness, income, the average American family has fallen behind the rich, and not just a little, but a lot. The average American family in 2013 holds 1 89th of the wealth of the top 1%. And we should remember that the top 1% is not a homogenous group. There are about a million households, and the top 1% of that group doesn't look very much like the bottom. In 1968, the sociologist Robert Merton coined the phrase, the Matthew effect, drawing on a verse in the Gospel of Matthew. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And what makes me despair is how accurate this seems to be. Those who have a lot are getting more and more, and those that much are struggling and even losing ground. And the great promises of the 20th century those of racial, gender, and class equality have been ephemeral. Indeed, we are in the middle of a new gilded age. Last year, the $1,542 billionaires increased their combined wealth by a fifth to a record $6 trillion. This is wealth concentration as high as in 1905, when the vast monopolized fortunes of the so-called robber barons drove so much consternation that it led to the trust busting of the Roosevelt administration. So yes, it's the rich that have grown immeasurably richer over the last 20 or 30 years. But this time, it's qualitatively different. It's not merely that they have more money and influence, but through the use of offshoring and freedom from capital controls of the post-war era, they've largely broken free from the rule of governments. The rich choose their jurisdictions, some of them genuinely citizens of nowhere. In the olden days, it was basically Switzerland, and now there are endless tax-minimizing jurisdictions, with the titans of Wall Street and the city of London only too happy to help industrialists, tech gods, dictators, and gangsters salt their loot away out of government reach like so many smaugs sleeping with one baleful eye open, caring only about their wealth. And what is true of the rich is equally true of large corporations. 
especially global businesses and especially global tech. Apple has stashed 250 billion in bank accounts on the Channel Islands, which it fled to when Ireland changed its rules. The top five US companies stashed cash, all tech, amounts to 500 billion, half a trillion dollars, sitting behind lawyers, brass plates, in serviced offices, in the BVI, the Channel Islands, the Cayman Islands, etc. And while the Fortune 500 in total have 2.5 trillion dollars held offshore, untaxed, unused, barren, sterile. And in principle, these companies are supposed to allocate profits across their various subsidiaries, as if these offshoots were independent entities, trading goods and services among themselves at the prevailing market price. In practice, that is laughable. The prices of intergroup transactions are routinely manipulated by offshore accounting firms to, ma to make their global profits appear in low-tax jurisdictions. And a growing number of multinationals locate their algorithms, trademarks, and logos, and tax havens, it's sorry, to, in tax havens to strip away earnings from countries such as Britain and the US where they're generated. And for sheer get stuff to frontery, the most spectacular is Google Alphabet. In 2003, a year before its IPO, Google US transferred its search and advertising technologies to Google Holdings, a subsidiary incorporated in Ireland, which for Irish tax purposes is a resident of Bermuda. Ever since then, all the profits generated by those assets have ended up in Bermuda after a tax-free detour via the Netherlands in the infamous double Irish Dutch sandwich. In 2015, Google Alphabet reported 15.5 billion in profits in Bermuda, where the corporate tax rate is a helpful 0%. This is the same alphabet whose leaders are regularly run out onto TV to bitch, kvetch, and indeed plead that they want to pay their taxes. They're begging to pay their taxes if only someone in the government will show them how. And the sheer shameless Pharisee cant of it all. It's just as well they've ditched their don't be or do evil end line, a soft, appointed, and derisively low bar, and one that Google has consistently failed to get over. Globally, the data suggests more than $600 billion is artificially shifted by multinationals to the world's tax havens each year. Who loses? Well, by and large, it's the US and the bigger European countries, where most of the multinationals, workers and consumers are located. Tax havens deprive the EU of a fifth of the corporate tax revenue it currently collects, $60 billion a year. In the UK, it's about $12.7 billion, and in the US, it's $50 billion. And this would be shameful in a time of global plenty. But when even the richest economies are struggling to fund basic services out of general taxation, this avoidance is theft by another name, and theft in plain sight. And it's not a uniquely American problem. Indeed, the most outrageous example of the arrogance of these elites uh, is, uh, is Her Majesty the Queen. Paid for as she substantially is out of general taxation, her advisers felt that it was fine to take 10 million pounds and stick it in a tax-avoiding British Virgin Island Trust. I mean, you really couldn't make this shit up. And of course, this drip drip of economic and social pain describes the populist yellow brick road to Brexit and indeed the current US administration. And I know it's not all economics, but the complex brew of seemingly intractable personal economic woes added to a sense of nostalgia, and with, in both cases, the easy target of mass immigration and out-of-touch elites reinforce each other and turn passive grumbling into populist political activism. And of course, I recognize that many corporations pay their taxes and that many billionaires are profound and important philanthropists, changing the world for the better. But for every billionaire donating his fortune away, there are a dozen with wealth planning strategies starting from the premise of tax minimization. And as Obama said, the problem is not that this stuff is illegal, but that it's illegal. And for some reason, people think that legal is the same as good, and it's not. This is a profound moral issue. It's paralyzing the pusillanimous political class and the Davos do-gooders, a group uniquely consistent in their inability neither to forecast trends nor to identify remedies. Tax avoidance hollows out the state and drives inequality and defeats the idea that at least to some degree, we're all in this together. In terms of both income and wealth inequality, the US finds itself substantially more unequal than other OECD countries, and that wasn't true 100 years ago. 
Why, and why is it important? Well, the why is set out in enormous detail by Edward Wolf in another hefty book, A Century of American Wealth, but it can be summarized as massive, indeed staggering, tax reductions for the wealthy over the last 30 years. The financialization of the economy with those financial assets mostly held by the rich and taxed, taxed favorably when compared to labor. The death by a thousand cuts meted out to Social Security, the stagnation of real wages as more and more highly paid jobs are replaced by service sector and part-time work, and above all, the helplessness of government and the indifference of those, still the majority, who think they're doing okay or will be soon. As Demosthenes says, the easiest people in the world to deceive are ourselves because we believe what we want to. And these two, there are two pernicious memes that are propagated through the US and to a lesser extent through other Western market economies. And the first is the meritocracy, the idea that people rise or sink as their ability and effort determines. And putting to one side the truth that when the term was coined, it was actually to satirize the idea that people succeeded and failed largely on their own efforts run and, and discounted the effects of luck or ill fortune. But perhaps this effect really does exist, shaking up society like a giant snow globe, reinvigorating society with the talented poor and weeding out the rich fools. I mean, after all, that's the sort of heart of every fairy tale we learn to school children. If there was anything in the meritocracy, we should see social mobility on a large scale. And sadly, we don't. In the US, your parents' income is more predictive of your income than any other factor and far more so than any other OECD country where inherited advantage is to some extent mitigated by state interventions. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, and it's baffling to me this, there is a standing majority in the US in favor of repealing the inheritance tax, which affects fewer than 1% of estates. And by the way, Fox News, you don't pay it twice. The second time, you're dead. Secondly, and held to be almost true by definition, is the idea that government is the problem, famously and brilliantly summarized by Ronald Reagan's most terrifying, in the words, in the, most terrifying words in the English language, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. When did we lose faith in the ability of the public collective to do good, but afford so much latitude to private collectives, otherwise known as the corporation? Robert Caro is still plowing away at his fifth volume of The Life of Lyndon Johnson, gives us fascinating insight to why this dissonance exists. He asserts that from the late 40s, there was an explicit effort by big business, aided and abetted by evangelical Christianity, to counter the positive public view of government. After all, government had dealt with depression eventually, fought two world wars, had organized and executed against vast production plans, groundbreaking technical development, development and it's not only moonshots uh, and nuclear weapons. Most of the core tech in your smartphones was developed by DARPA or the DOE or public universities. Remember that in the 20s and 30s, American populist politics was from the left and highly receptive to good vibes from Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not by instinct a conspiracy theorist, but sometimes the best trick the devil has is to persuade us that he doesn't exist. And of course, it's probably just a load of rich men and corporations gradually bumping the social contract away from the place at the heart of society where it protects the average and Joe, the average Joe and ensures to some extent a fair crack at the American dream. Instead, converting citizens to consumers, and more often than not, debt-burdened consumers, apolitical, alone, suspicious of government, and helpless in the face of market forces. And whether you subscribe to conspiracy or just some sort of public life pendulum swinging against the government since the beatings of the 70s, Vietnam, race, energy, deindustrialization, and so forth, it seems undeniable that governments that we have today are ill-equipped both in temperament and capability to deal with today's problems or capture today's opportunities. Indeed, sometimes it looks as if they aren't even trying. Why is it Elon Musk, not America, that's going to Mars when it was America that went to the moon? Why is it Bill Gates and not the World Health Organization that's curing malaria when it was the combined efforts of many nations that wiped out smallpox? Well, we are where we are because that's what we deserve. We depend on the grudging or enthusiastic philanthropy of billionaires to alleviate our condition because our public institutions are weak or venal and only the market can be trusted. Is that what you believe? 
We should all care about inequality and beyond the basic bleeding heart liberal idea that when people are starving, it's a crime to have too much. And that having, as we do in the UK, 37% of children born into relative poverty, which is in of itself a source of national individual shame, the case against inequality was set out at length nearly a decade ago in the spirit level, why more equal societies almost always do better. The book highlights the pernicious effects that inequality has on society, eroding trust, increasing anxiety and illness, and encouraging excessive consumption. And what it does is it looks for correlations between inequality as expressed by the Gini coefficient and a whole range of lousy outcomes. You know, poor physical health, poor mental health, drug abuse, education, imprisonment, obesity, social mobility, trust, all kinds of things. And the outcomes are significantly worse in more unequal countries. And the jaw-dropping fact is not just that they're worse for the poor or worse on average. The outcomes are worse for every income decile. They're worse for the rich as well as the poor. And the strong implication of this is that growth unmanaged by tax and distribution is not the holy grail of government economic policy, but might actually be killing its host societies. And if this is all too airy-fairy for you, let me give you some very stark facts about the US today. And forgive me, I'm speaking to an American audience, so I've gone quite hard and dark into Amer to America bullet points. Um, most of these apply to some degree to the rest of the world. Most of you will know some of them, some of you will know all of them, but to my mind, they're utterly shocking and a direct consequence or a manifestation of inequality and greed. When I started writing this paper, the richest eight Americans owned as much as the bottom 50%. When I finished writing this paper, it was the richest three Americans. <laughs> the richest 62 humans own as much as the bottom 3.5 billion. Seven of the leading Republican donors have offshored between them 142 billion, avoiding tax and breaching the social contract. In normalized terms, the top 1% pay 30% less tax than they did in 1980, despite being four times wealthier. The top income decile lives 15% longer than the bottom decile, but the worst zip code has a life expectancy of half that of the best. The much-fated Sackler family earn $800 million a year by selling OxyContin as a highly addictive pain management drug that drives 140 deaths a day, mostly amongst the poor. For the first time in 100 years, low-income white men and women have a lower life expectancy than their parents. America has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. 2.6 million people incarcerated, and since you ask, that's a million more than China. The wealth gap between black and white families has expanded by a third since 1983. Half a million Americans have been killed by firearms this century. And this, I think, is this last point, I think, is my summary point of appalled bemusement. In 2000, exactly one third of Americans described themselves as lower class. By 2015, that number had risen to almost half. And what is the government's agenda? Unwind large chunks of healthcare provision for the poor, policies which actually accelerate climate change, which land on the poor first and most acutely. It's no comfort to me at all that the first town likely to be permanently flooded, Cameron, Louisiana, also voted 90% for Donald Trump. Fighting wars in multiple territories which are fought by the poor and then massively cutting taxes that will disproportionately benefit the rich, including members of the government. Don't make the mistake of thinking we're anywhere near full immiseration. Climate change and accompanying resource conflict is going to drive large-scale human migration to, human and North to Europe and North Africa with all the petty and substantial conflict that this entails. Stacks has been written about automation and AI, which I don't need to rehash. But suffice to say that even if this only impacts 10% of jobs this side of 2050, and I've heard estimates of up to 50, the financial repercussions will be massive. Finally, and surprisingly, I have to add medtech to the list of ills about to engulf mankind. Medicine on the cusp of profound advances, on a par with the discovery of antibiotics, cure or long-term management of most cancer within reach, repair or replacement of organs, replacement and rest restoration of telomeres. All of these therapies will mature in the next decade, but a cost that is frankly unsustainable for no most national health services. So these therapies are going to be the, be the preserve of the rich, or possibly the old and medicated, so not only are the poor, and by the poor, I really mean the middle class and below, now structurally poorer, 
largely without the help and support of the government. Many of them, white and those blue-collar jobs remaining, are going to lose their jobs, and those jobs aren't coming back. Rather, people will be competing down their hourly rates in overpopulated, semi-monopsonistic marketplaces. And finally, they're going to have shorter lives. Poor, unemployed, short-lived, nasty, brutish, and short. And living within security states that, for the first time, can realistically track your hopes, needs, dreams, and ambitions, each one of us, all of the time. So as Lenin asked, what is to be done? Well, first of all, you need to want to resist. Everything that I've described appears to me to be the short fuse before national disaster, but I'm aware that I'm deeply partisan, and someone must like it, because the politics that entail it do generate the votes. The short-term good news is that Democrats are now beginning, beginning to emulate the Republicans. In the medium term, that's bad news, but we can worry about that later. In 2011, Michael Tomsky compared cross-party support on a number of issues for the uh, second Bush and Obama administrations. The average Democratic support for Republican bills was 41%. The support for Democratic bills, on the other hand, by Republicans was just 5%, almost as though they were playing two different games. In the age of Donald Trump, it looks like the Democrats, while still being able to do deals, actually opposes a bloc and do so consistently, even those senators from reddish states, states that supported the president. Resistance is good. It is, in fact, what oppositions are supposed to do. But what about a platform of positive policies that address the contagion of tax avoidance and inequality? This is what Bernie says. We must come together and reduce income and wealth inequality by... And then he lists about 20 different policy provisions, which you can go to his website and, and, and discover. And they range from, to me, the unambiguous, make sure that everyone has health care and pays their taxes through the desirable, tertiary education free at the point of delivery, universal childcare, to the more partisan, such as breaking up the banks, withdrawing from international trade agreements, and strengthening unions. But there's nothing in that list that isn't worth thinking about. And I don't know whether it adds, what it adds up to, or by how much tax we need to go up to pay for it, or whether anyone has explained the Laffer curve to Bernie. But enacting a basket of these policies would go some considerable way to reducing inequality in America. But writing lists is easy, and getting into effective power is hard. It requires purposeful activism, up to and including kinetic protest. It's not enough to like things on Facebook, or to turn up to a rally when the weather's pleasant, and you have your mates and a beer in your hand. Without activism, and in particular, revving up support, rallying of voters to every poll, and making sure that your leaders at every level of government know what you know, we will be ignored or impotent. We need marches and mayors. So, yes, you need policies and activists, activists. But above all, I believe combating inequality is a unifying theme when properly articulated, something we all have an interest as citizens and indeed humans. And if we don't, well, we know how this story ends. We know what happened at the end of the last low-down, dirty, dishonest decade. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. A blood-dim tide is loosed, and all about us, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best like all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do better than that.